We have a great session for us um, ahead of us. Our first speaker is Dr. Daniel Bell. Dr. Bell is professor of theology and ethics at Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary in Columbia, South Carolina. His books include Liberation Theology After the End of History, published by Rutledge in 2001, Just War as Christian Discipleship, Brazos 2009, um, just purchased that one outside on the book, so, uh, book table myself, and Economies of Desire, Christianity and Capitalism in a Postmodern World, published by Baker Academic 2012, also available outside. Dr. Bell's work addresses issues of war and peace, the moral life, stewardship, and the mission of the church today. The title of his presentation is Just War and Christian Discipleship. Please welcome with me Dr. Bell. Well, I, I think after that last question and answer session, I'm gonna have to change the title to uh, Just War and Farm Animals. And we were scared of drones, but now we're going to have to worry about how to teach uh, sheep discrimination and proportionality. So, and actually, that's not really that, that's absurd, but it's not really that far from what I've been asked to do today. I've been asked to talk about just war as a distinctly Christian form of politics. But that's a rather odd claim, almost as odd as saying we should arm sheep. Because let's face it, most Christians don't know the just war tradition. Even after 10 years of war, what most of us know about the just war tradition, we could put on the back of a postage stamp. That really doesn't amount to a Christian politics. And even those Christians who do know the just war tradition, the way we use it doesn't really suggest any kind of politics, distinctively Christian politics, either. Typically, what happens? We pull out the just war theory on the eve of a conflict, and we use it as a checklist. Let's see, is the war being declared, uh, is it being declared by a legitimate authority? Check. Uh, is there a just, talk, just cause? Check. Is there a right intent? Check. And we go down the list. Indeed, the very way we talk about it, the just war theory, points to a problem. It's a theory that's dusted off and applied in a specific situation, more like a math problem than a politics. Its relevance to life is occasional, momentary, episodic certainly not indicative of a way of life that, that might constitute a distinctively Christian politics. And if we listen to the church pronouncements and publications, if we follow those, this checklist can be applied easily and quickly. Moreover, it can be applied pretty much by anyone without any particular training or formation, and certainly without being immersed intentionally in the life of any particular political community. In other words, the way we use just war clearly is not a distinctively Christian politics. That's a problem. My first sub-point today is just war and politics. Just war is always already politics. Whether we recognize it or not, just war is part of a political vision. And whether we are aware of it or not, even the rather superficial way that Christians invoke just war today is deeply embedded in a politics, the politics of contemporary North American political liberalism. The superficial checklist approach to just war serves contemporary North American politics well, assuring, among other things, that there will be no substantial challenge either to the nation state's political sovereignty or to its wars from Christians as such. Consider the reactions to pronouncements by church leaders. You know, when the church has come out with statements on war, the reactions of Christians to those statements pretty much fall in line with the politics of party, ideology, and interest group. Democrats tend to support democratic wars and Republicans tend to support Republican wars and they critique each other. And surveys support this kind of claim that the way Christians think about war is not actually influenced by their Christianity. Thus, debating just war theory becomes a kind of theopolitical entertainment, at most providing Christians an opportunity to feel like they are being responsible, doing something, either supporting the troops or resisting what they think is an unjust war. But there is no space for selective conscientious objection, either for the Christian soldier or the Christian taxpayer. And so the wars go on, and we dutifully, dutifully fight for them and pay for them. Well, a generation ago, Paul Ramsey attempted to remind the church 
that his just war doctrine was part of a Christian theory of statecraft. Just war, he said, was a political military doctrine by which he meant that just war did not stand alone, but rather it was intrinsically embedded in a larger vision and practice of human governance and politics. The Ramsey was reacting against what he saw as two different distortions of the just war thinking. One vision, one distortion of just war reduced it to a solitary military doctrine. This is the kind of use where folks whip out the just war tradition and invoke it uh, to, to threaten the use of force or to use force without regard for the political con context or without regard for the political consequences of such action. The other thing Ramsey was attacking, we might call the solitary moralistic doctrine or the solitary moralistic use of just war. This is where you invoke just war uh, divorced from both politics and military action insofar as you're using just war as a casuistic checklist with which to de delegitimize all wars one by one. Now today, what I want us to do, what I want to encourage, is I want us to take up Ramsey's challenge. I want to encourage the church to be more intentional uh, and more deliberate in considering how its advocacy and practice of just war is part and parcel of an expansive political vision. However, I want to go beyond Ramsey, suggesting that he did not go far enough in articulating the distinctively Christian character of this political vision. Ramsey helpfully reminds us that just war is at home in a broader political vision. However, he misses the mark to the extent that he identifies the appropriate Christian politics of war as a politics of statecraft. He misses the mark because at its best, the Christian practice of just war is not a matter of politics as statecraft, but as churchcraft. Politics as churchcraft. We might say that just war as Christian discipleship begins not with the state as the primary political agency, but the church. What follows then is an attempt to articulate just war as a distinctly Christian political witness, which means that it is an effort to recenter the tradition, the just war tradition, in the church rather than the state. And as we will see, starting from the church rather than the state has significant implications for what the discipline of just war entails, both in terms of the kinds of people it calls for and the demands it makes on such people. My second point today is two strands of the just war tradition. Just war is not a theory, but a tradition. There is, in fact, no such thing as the just war theory or the just war doctrine. There is no single set in stone fixed account of what constitutes a just war. Instead, just war thinking and practice in the church is a tradition. As Alistair McIntyre has said, a tradition is kind of an argument extended over time. And that's what the just war practice of the church has been. It's a tradition that looks very different when it started through Augustine 2,000 years ago, looks very different from what it looked like in the medieval world, Aquinas, Victorian stuff, and it looks very different today. So it's an ongoing, developing tradition with different currents and strands. Recognizing that just war is a tradition, we can distinguish two, two strands within that tradition, corresponding to two different politics, those of the modern nation state and those of the church or what I call just war as a public policy checklist and just war as Christian discipleship. Two different politics of just war. Now, just war as a public policy checklist. It's rooted in modern nation states and international law, and as such, it is principally concerned with defining the moral responsibilities of states and the politicians who guide them. As a tool of statecraft, just war takes the form of a checklist of criteria meant to, to guide the decision making, uh, the decision makers and the policy makers. What is noteworthy about this form of just war, the public policy checklist approach, is that anyone can use the checklist. It requires little or no preparation or training. On the eve of war, all you have to do is memorize the criteria and then muster the willpower to abide by them. Furthermore, character does not matter. You can be a scoundrel 
someone who has never cared about your neighbor, and yet if you can check off the criteria, you can claim to be waging a just war. In contrast, just war's Christian discipleship finds its center in the life and the convictions of the Christian community, and it is rooted in the church's commitment to follow Christ by loving and seeking justice for its neighbors, even its enemy neighbors in war. As such, just war is not primarily a checklist of rules, but an expression of the character of the Christian community. It names the extension of that character and the virtues that mark the day-to-day -day life of the Christian community and peacetime. It marks the extension of that character and those virtues that we live out in our everyday lives into the realm of war. Just as the church loves and seeks justice for its neighbors in times of peace, just as it acts with prudence and courage and prudence and courage and temperance in times of peace, so too it acts in war. What this means is that just war requires not just information and not just willpower, but long-term preparation. Memorizing a checklist of criteria is not sufficient. Just warriors cannot be pulled like a rabbit from a hat on the eve of war. This is the case because character and the virtues are not formed in an instant but require time. It takes time to learn and inhabit the dispositions, the instincts, the judgments, and the vision associated with just war as a Christian form of politics. Just war as Christian discipleship recognizes that you are not likely to sustain justice and prudence and honor and courage, both physical and moral. In the moral pressure cooker that is war, if you are, have not learned to embody and sustain those virtues before war. In some just wars, Christian discipleship recognizes the truth behind General Sir John Winthrop Hackett's observation, what a bad man cannot be is a good soldier, sailor, or airman. An unjust people cannot wage a just war, no matter how many checklists they produce and complete on the eve of a war. My third point, the difference that just war as churchcraft makes. Consi we've already seen one form, one difference that just war as Christian discipleship makes. That is, it requires preparation. A just war people, if the church is going to be a just war people, then it has to be about forming the virtues, the character, the habits, the dispositions that are required to embody the just war tradition long before the war starts. So that's one big difference there. It's not a checklist, you just pull it on the eve and check off. But let's consider some of the criteria to see the difference that just war as a Christian form of politics makes. For the sake of time, I'm obviously just gonna be able to summarize some of these points and hit some of the highlights. Consider the criterion of legitimate authority. Legitimate authority concerns first who wages a war. Now both the public policy checklist approach and the discipleship approach uh, recognize that uh, governing authorities, states, wage war. But there is a significant difference between these two traditions regarding the nature of political office and authority. Just war as a public policy checklist is at home in modern political liberalism, which is distinguished by the thinnest of common goods, namely the liberty to pursue one's self-interest. And as a result of that, a government government focused on pursuing self-interest, wars become waged primarily to defend a government or a nation's interests. Wars become defensive and couched in terms of defending national interests. And too often in this checklist approach, political office is treated as a kind of prize with which one asserts one's interests or which one uses to, dis uh, to, dis to dispense benefits for the sake of accruing more power. Compare that with just war as Christian discipleship, an ecclesial politics that is distinguished by a thick conception of the common good, as well as a corresponding account of political office, not as a prize, but as an office, as a responsibility for the common good. As we will see momentarily, this commitment of uh, just war as Christian discipleship to a thick conception of the common good and to understanding political office as a service, a responsibility for the common good, make a big difference for how we think about just cause. Also under legitimate authority, you ask the question not only who, wa who wages war, but we ask the question, who determines the justice of a particular war? The public policy checklist approach defers to heads of state, 
Heads of state basically decide if an injustice has been committed and they go to war. Just War's Christian discipleship is a bit more complex. It says, first of all, the first node, the first place where this decision is made is heads of state with wise advisors. With wise advisors. And this, this, this claim that we have to have not just heads of state but wise advisors points us to a couple of things. It suggests that the decision to go to war is not simply a matter of information, but it is also a matter of formation. It is a matter of people who are capable, have been formed to, to uh, exercise sound moral judgment. Victoria has this wonderful quote, the medieval theologian who did much to think about the just war tradition. He says, of course the head of state can't make a decision to go to war on their own, because the head of state is no different from the rest of us, subject to the same sins, subject to the same passions, and so he, he, and it is he in his case, he needs to be surrounded by wise and virtuous advisors who will remind him of the commitment to the common good. This raises an interesting question for our Christian politics. How do we help form our churches to think about who to support in public office? Do we encourage one another to say, hey, and do we encourage the politicians that would attract our votes to seek the common good? Or do we just continue this kind of politics of pandering where, hey, if you'll serve my interests, you'll get my vote? So first point of decision in the Christian tradition is the head of state with wise advisors. Second point of decision are soldiers. At its best, the just war tradition in, the Christian, in Christianity says that individual soldiers are supposed to make decisions about the justness of a war. Now, it does say, and this is important, it says, however, they are supposed to give the prince, the head of state, the benefit of a doubt, which means they can't simply say, it's not my concern, right? It's not my job to think about the justice of war. Mine is just to go and die. No, they are actually supposed to make evaluations of the justice of war. However, if they're uncertain, they are to give the benefit of the doubt to the prince. If, however, they are certain that the war is unjust, they are not to fight. The third point, and by the way, this is a significant point. This second point about soldiers making these decisions tells us something about our politics too, doesn't it? It tells you that Christian soldiers are supposed to have an identity and a political allegiance that transcends the nation state. The third point of decision in the Christian tradition is the church. Determinations of the justice of a war were subject, have been throughout the history of the church, subject to the oversight of the church particularly through the interventions of bishops in the, affairs of, in the affairs of princes and in the practice of confession, where princes and soldiers were examined and guided in the examination of conscience. Now, I don't know what you all think about this last point today. Do we really want churches making these kinds of decisions? Do we have churches and do we have church leaders who, we, who are capable of making these kinds of decisions? I don't think we should discount the political force of this practice, this church oversight, notwithstanding how the domestication and the nationalization and the fragmentation, the brokenness of the church has diminished the force of this practice. Right? The brokenness of the church means, ah, if one church says you can't do it, well, I'll go find another church that says I can. The brokenness of a church is a real problem with the Christian politics of just war. But as we think about the church as exercising its oversight in the tradition, one of the things, again, we can come back to is the practice of selective conscientious objection. The nation state currently recognizes conscientious objection, right? If you are opposed to all wars, the state recognizes that. And that might be fine if you're a pacifist, but if you're a member of a church that lifts up just war, that doesn't work, does it? Because just warriors don't reject all wars, they only reject what? Unjust wars, which means there's got to be some notion of selective conscientious objection. So that's one form of a Christian politics of just war, is if indeed our, most of our churches, many of our churches, claim to be just war churches, then we should be actively working for the recognition of selective conscientious objection. How are we doing on time? 20 minutes? Got 15 left? Ooh. Next criterion, just cause. The public policy checklist approach follows the modern trend which has reduced just cause pretty much to national self-defense. As a result of the reduction of just cause to national self-defense, just the public policy checklist approach has a really hard time with humanitarian intervention. And we've seen that a lot over the last 20 years. 
Just War's Christian discipleship is much more other regarding in its take. Just Cause is about the defense of an innocent third party in the face of unjust aggressors. In other words, for Christians, Just Cause is not first and foremost a matter of self-defense. As Augustine actually says at one point, we would rather be killed than kill. Rather, insofar as Christians are concerned, we are concerned with the common good and not self or even national interests. And as a result, we're not limited to defensive wars and we have no particular qualms about humanitarian interventions or other military actions where national defense and national interests are not at stake. To move on to the criterion of right intention, Just War's public policy checklist pretty much has dismissed right intention. I mean, on the books, right intention is still technically, you've got to be for peace, and you have to forswear revenge. But it's widely recognized that this is all but defunct. Just War's Christian discipleship is much more substantial with regard to right intention. First of all, it says war is fought for peace, but not simply for peace, but for a just peace. As Augustine noted a long time ago, every war that's ever been fought has been fought for peace. It's just a peace that better suited the aggressor. I don't like the way things are now, so I want a better kind of peace that suits me better, so I'm going to go to war until I get a better kind of peace. So Augustine says wisely, what we're really after is a just peace. In other words, the peace must not be merely self-serving, but truly just. That is, it must build up the common good. Also, right intention for just war's Christian discipleship is loving our enemy. In a just war, we are not exempt from loving our enemy neighbor. Matthew 5, still applies to soldiers. Indeed, in waging war, the right intent is not to destroy the enemy, but to bring to them the benefits of a just peace. Even in, our, even in war, our hope is that the enemy will turn and embrace the order of peace and justice. And so as Augustine wrote again, therefore it ought to be necessity and not your will that destroys the enemy who is fighting you. We don't want to destroy our enemy. Paul Ramsey said the same thing. The object of a Christian going to war is not to kill the enemy. In other words, just war, this Christian discipleship is about the formation of sad, reluctant killers. Again, to quote Augustine, because he's so good on these matters, wars and conquests, he says, may rejoice unprincipled men, but are a sad necessity in the eyes of men of principle. And lastly, under right intention, we need to talk about complete justice. This gets to the issue of character, the consistency and the completion of the desire for justice. It rules out the selective enforcement or the selective appeal to justice. Oh, we cry out for justice in this situation while we're turning a blind eye to that one. Just War's Christian discipleship rooted in a character for justice says we can't do that. We can't selectively appeal to the tradition, selectively invoke justice. It also means that as we go about waging a just war, we have to be engaged in self-examination and confession where we have been complicitous in injustice. And we have to be open to listen to others and hear their complaints against us. And it also, this commitment to justice and complete justice, not only is a matter of looking backwards at how we may have been involved in injustice, it also means looking forward. It's, we are committed to justice after the shooting stops. We are committed to bringing the benefits of a just peace to our enemies uh, when the shooting stops. We don't just abandon them or neglect them or replace one tyrant with another. And I think in this point here on intention, we can see pretty clearly how just war is a distinctively Christian politics is perhaps, uh, it's perhaps no more clear than here, how it's distinctive, right? Loving enemies, confessing wrongdoing, making amends requires an extraordinary politics, maybe even a supernatural one. Last resort. The criterion of last resort on the public policy checklist, the main way it's used today, Last resort's in uh, increasingly going, falling by the wayside, sort of like right intent. Uh, it's increasingly being dismissed. One of the leading just war theorists, secular just war theorists, actually has come out and said, look, once you've suffered a, a, an injustice that rises to the level of a just cause, when you strike back is solely a matter of strategic advantage. That's basically a dismissal of last resort. And also under this reading of last resort, the focus and much attention is on building better hammers. 
You've heard the saying, right? When all you've got a hammer, all you have is a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. In the public policy a checklist approach, we spend all our time and energy building better and better weapons. Whereas the just war is Christian tradition, uh, Christian discipleship says you have to be engaged in good faith diplomacy. And you, if you're serious about just war, and if you're serious about last resort, then you have to devote time and energy to alternatives other than war. And here I'd simply bring to mind the just peacemaking initiatives that folks have publicized over the last 15 years. There's lots of things in there that I think fit really well with this Christian notion of just war and uh, last resort. It means basically we don't spend all our time just building better hammers. If we're deeply committed to this discipline, we're deeply committed to right in, uh, last resort, then we're going to be spending our time and energy looking at ways, uh, alternatives to war. Reasonable chance of success is the next criterion. The goals of a war should be attainable. Just wars are limited wars. Um, where, the two war, where the two traditions, the public policy approach and the Christian tr discipleship approach differ, comes to the moral imperative of surrender. This criteria, reasonable chance of success says, even if you've got just cause, even if you've suffered an injustice, if you can't wage war within the parameters of the tradition and win, then you can't wage war. And if you start a war, and you, uh, or go into a war, and you think you can still win following the parameters of the tradition, and then something changes so you realize you can't, then there is what John Howard Yoder called a moral imperative of surrender. The public policy checklist approach doesn't really like that moral imperative of surrender. Indeed, the dominant vision of just war today says, when you're faced with annihilation, an emergency situation, then you can throw the tradition out the window. Just War's Christian discipleship says, no, we stick to the tradition. We stick to our discipline. We stick to our convictions. Again, we have two very different politics here, right? One that believes that the force of arms is all that stands between us and oblivion, and the other vision of Just War that is a kind of politics of resurrection. As we get near the end, I'll mention the criterion of discrimination because there's a significant difference here. When we can turn to actually look at the criteria, the discipline of just war as it deals with how war is fought, there's two criteria. The first criteria is discrimination. It says that civilians may not be intentionally or directly targeted and killed. Just war's public policy approach interprets this criterion permissively. Basically, it says, and this is a summary, as long as one does not intentionally target civilians and the military benefit is deemed to outweigh the cost, then civilian deaths are permitted. That's permissive. As long as you don't intentionally target them and as long as it's worth the cost, it's okay if they're killed. Just War's Christian discipleship is much more responsible. It rejects that permissive rendering of the criterion in favor of recognizing a responsibility to protect. Thus, it's not sufficient that civilians are not intentionally targeted. Rather, because we are called to love our neighbors, we actively seek to avoid their deaths. Thus, we have a responsibility to avoid even unintentional deaths that are foreseen as likely. And the great example here is Aquinas in his treatise on evil, where he talks about this woodcutter in the, in the woods. And he says, if there's a woodcutter and the woodcutter's cutting wood, don't get me going too many times, uh, the woodcutter's cutting wood, in a part of the forest where there's rarely ever people, and he cuts down a tree and it kills someone, he's not culpable. But if he's cutting a wood in a part of the forest where people are regularly walking around, and he cuts down a tree, you know, unintentionally kills one, he's still morally culpable. That's the difference here. The permissive reading says, hey, as long as you didn't intend to kill the civilian and it was worth it, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Even if you could tell there was going to be civilian deaths. Just Wars Christian discipleship is much more rigorous, much more responsible. It says, even if you can see, if it's not intended, but if you see they're likely, you don't do it. <laughs> Lastly, proportionality. And how close are we? Five minutes? Well, this would be about right. Proportionality is a criterion that says the force used in battle must be directed against military targets. Just Wars public policy checklist, again, tends to be very permissive, reducing this to a cost-benefit analysis holding simply that the benefits of the use of force must outweigh the costs. As a result, the public policy checklist approach sanctions a policy of maximum allowable force. 
in political science circles, it's the Powell Weinberger doctrine, right? Go in with overwhelming force. Just War as Christian discipleship, again, is much more restrictive. It says that the force must be directed against le towards legitimate goals of the war and, this is the key thing, that the use of force must be minimized. Thus, it restricts the just use of force to the minimum necessary. Indeed, that's what military necessity actually originally meant. It no longer means that. It's been taken out to say do what you need. Military necessity overrules a criterion, but originally military necessity meant only use force that's militarily necessary. Okay, because I wasn't going to talk about worship, just war and how worship forms us to be just warriors or might form us to be just warriors, but I ran out of time for that, so let me simply conclude with two paragraphs, and I think I'll actually be close to my time. I have 10 minutes? You're fine. Oh, okay, 10 minutes. Well, then I will do a little bit on worship, <laughs> since that's actually what they asked me to do. <laughs> it's always nice when the speaker finally gets there, you know? All right, okay. Just war and worship. Do this very briefly. Comparing just war as a policy guide for nation states and just war as a form of Christian politics leaves the impression that just war as Christian discipleship is more demanding in terms both of restraint and the responsibility it embodies. Such a conclusion, however, that it's simply more demanding and more restraining in some ways, only scratches the surface of the fundamental difference between the two politics. In this last section, I want to talk about the difference that worship makes. The fundamental difference that Just War's Christian discipleship represents concerns worship. One vision claims to worship the Blessed Trinity, the other doesn't. In this last part of my presentation, I was going to summarize the connection between Just War as, as Christian discipleship and worship. And there's two dimensions to this claim. First, to the extent that Just War's Christian discipleship demands extraordinary, and some of us might even say supernatural restraint and responsibility, it is clearly related to the love of God experienced and expressed in worship. It is this love that moves us to risk our lives and those of our loved ones for the sake of our neighbors, for the common good, for our enemies, and so forth. But the second way that just war as a Christian politics is related to worship concerns how the practice of worship may form us and shape us into a people of the character and virtues necessary to wage war in accordance with the restraint and the responsible discipline that is just war as Christian discipleship. This is to say just war as a, as a distinctive Christian politics is connected to worship as a means of grace through which we are sanctified made better than we otherwise would be as we are infused with the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. And what follows, let me briefly touch on a couple of the ways that worship might form us or not, and even deform us into a kind of people capable of embodying this discipline I've outlined. Let's look at legitimate authority. Legitimate authority calls for the church to maintain an identity that is independent of the nation state such, the church, such that the church can exercise its proper oversight regarding judgments of when to wage war. The practice of baptism clearly establishes this identity. Yet worship that clearly adheres to the modern split of religion and politics, relegating worship to the immaterial spiritual realm, actually undermines the church's ability to exercise its proper political oversight. Likewise, the church's independent identity may be undercut by the inclusion of national flags and pledges of allegiance in worship, insofar as such may reinforce the subordination of the church to the state. A similar thing may happen when the civic calendar overrules the liturgical calendar in worship, with Memorial Day trumping Trinity Sunday or the 4th of July becoming a religious festival. Just cause. We've got five minutes. Just cause calls for people who will forego self-interest and are willing to risk much in service to the neighbor. Whether it is a matter of kneeling, of reciting the Lord's Prayer, of being baptized, worship forms us as a people who die to the self turned inward and so are set free to turn outward in love toward our neighbors. The Eucharist forms us as a people of love and courage who, being incorporated into Christ's sacrifice, go into the world to give ourselves and our loved ones and our resources for others. Likewise, the practice of offering forms us to give generously to others as we learn that all that we have is a gift given to us 
to be offered in service to God and our neighbors. Furthermore, the practice of confession and the recognition of seasons such as Lent are crucial to being a people capable of discerning just cause, which includes being able to hear complaints, just complaints from those whom we have wronged and recognizing when we are guilty and making amends. By contrast, worship that is framed in terms of meeting my felt needs, affirmation, and therapy only reinforces the self-interest that neglects our neighbors. Likewise, the absence of the regular celebration of the Eucharist leaves us susceptible either to the wrong sacrifices, unjust wars, or to failing to risk and sacrifice for others when we should. Same thing with when we turn confession into this vague abstraction. We don't actually learn how to recognize just complaints against ourselves. I'll just have to stop there with the other criteria and let me conclude. Just war as a distinctly Christian form of politics asks a great deal of those who would abide by its discipline. It asks of Christians that they recognize that their identity is found first and foremost, not in the nation state, but in Christ and his body, the church. This is no small task or petty challenge given the pretensions of modern states. It also asks that Christians who would wage just wars do so not in defense of self and self-interest, but out of love for their neighbors, including their enemy neighbors. Accordingly, just war calls for people who can bear great risks, shoulder heavy responsibilities, and forego the consolations of a more permissive politics of war. But such risks and responsibilities are too much for any individual and too often are contrary to the interests of modern nation states. Indeed, they are too much for merely human communities and human politics. They require a different kind of politics founded on a power greater than any nation state can muster. That is why just war as Christian discipleship is finally not a matter of statecraft, but of churchcraft. For it is in the church, through the means of grace, that God makes us better than we otherwise would be, forming us in the virtues of faith, hope, and love. In the church, God makes a spirit-formed people capable of bearing the cross, of taking great risks and shouldering the tremendous responsibilities that come with loving their neighbors, even their enemy neighbors, in war. Thank you.